that could be something that can startle them and send them into this whole, this hypersensitive, okay? So you want to remember those things. Another thing that may have changed they, their driving habits. If they've been out there driving outside the FOB, they're driving crazy. And then they get back here and they're on I-10 and on 54, and you're like, so those are some of the ways that they may have changed. Their sleep habit, habits may have changed. Where they may have been a sound sleeper before, the slightest little sound will wake them up or they may not sleep thoroughly through the night. So those are some ways they may have changed and they may also have um, an issue with alcohol. Somebody might, some of them may go to alcohol to kind of numb them or to ease that pain or just to kind of make them feel more comfortable. They may have new battle buddies that you weren't aware of, you know, why, you were, why they were gone, just like you may have new friends. And then also, you know, they may have a more uh, sense of pride since they've been gone. So you want to keep that in mind. But just like our soldier has changed, you've changed as well. You may be more appreciative of your soldier. You know, you may feel a more sense of pride because, you know, here it is, my soldier has been out doing this wonderful thing, and I am so proud of him for what he's done. So you may have more sense of pride than you had before. And then also you may have more friends. You may have new friends. You may have made your own battle buddies that um, your spouse didn't know about before they left, okay? You may also have issues with sleep because it might be a situation where you didn't sleep well while they were gone because you're so used to having them there and now you have this empty side of the bed and you're having a hard time sleeping. So these are some of the changes that you may notice in yourself and that you may notice in your soldier when he gets back. How many of you have kids? Okay, your kids are also gonna go through a change. And I know Christy um, touched on this before. How old are you, do any of you have older kids or your kids? Six -year -old, uh, two six -year -old and a six-year-old and one-year-old. And how old are yours? 11 and two. 11 and two. 18, 16, and 14. Okay, on yours, were your 18, any of your children told, oh, you're going to be in charge while I'm gone? Okay, because some parents make that, um, I won't say it's a mistake, but they tell the child, oh, while I'm gone, you're going to be the one taking care of mommy. And then when they come back, they don't want to give up that role. So you want to make sure that you kind of explain to your kids what they're going on. For those of you that have younger children, they may, they may not be used to seeing daddy, and they're going to cling to you. And you need to make sure that you let your spouse know that this is a normal thing for the children to do as well, because they've become solely dependent on you taking care of them, that they're not looking at the fact that they're not used to seeing them. So it's going to take them a while to readjust to having mom or dad back around. So those are some things that you need to look for for your kids too. And it may be a situation where they might be even scared. They, especially the younger ones. They may be scared of mom or dad when they come back. You know, so you want to make sure that you explain that to your spouse, that this is something that's normal so that they don't feel that rejection. All right? We have what's called the dream versus the dream. The dream your dream of what's going to happen and their dream of what's going to happen. All right? How many of you are thinking about having your in-laws come for your soldier to come? Okay. Now, have you discussed this with your spouse that your in-laws are going to be here and you're on the same page? Okay, you want to make sure because you don't want to be in a situation where your spouse thinks, oh, I'm going to have this alone time with you and then here is my mom or your mom and they're like right there with us and I can't get a moment alone. So you want to make sure that you let your spouse know what's going on. A lot of times, if you haven't discussed that, one of the things that you might want to consider is having the in-laws, the extended family, come after, not to be there right when they get back, so that you guys can gel as a family again. But if you're both on the same page that it's okay for the in-laws to be here, then that's fine. If it was your spouse's choice to have the in-laws here and you didn't really want them here, you want to express that. Don't hold on to that. Just explain to them, well, we can have them come a couple of days later, but we need some time to be together, okay? Part of the um, dream versus the dream, we have different expectations as far as what went on while they were deployed. Your spouse may think, okay, or you may have the, uh, the 
thought that, okay, you're coming back. I have this long honey-do list, all these things that haven't been getting done. I'm ready for you to come in and do them. But on the flip side, they may be thinking, well, I've been gone all this time. You learned how to do this so you can continue doing what you were doing, okay? Or the romance. They may come back or you may think, oh, we're going to have this bed of roses and we're going to have this nice intimate time together. He may come home and is exhausted and fall asleep, okay? Or you have the kids. They're on the outside of the door banging on the door wanting mommy and daddy while you're trying to reconnect with each other. So you have to keep those type of things in mind. It's their dream versus your dream. So you want to make sure that you're communicating your, with your spouse even before they get here what you're expecting and what they're expecting. Let them know that you may not be able to sneak away to have that intimate time together. Or, you know what, I do have a long honey do list for you because I didn't learn those skills while you were gone. I left them and was waiting for you to get here. All right, so you want to make sure that you're communicating with your spouse what you're expecting and what they're expecting as well. We have what's called relationship strengths. Now, these are things that kept your relationship strong while, you were while your spouse was deployed. You have those things that you did during deployment, and then you're going to have those things that you did after deployment. What are some of the ways you kept your relationship strong while they were deployed? That he, you made sure that he knew things were being taken care of. So you're going to have to take those small steps and integrate him into that slowly, as opposed to just now that he's home, taking that time to just tell him everything. Did a lot of you use Skype? Because I know now with technology, a lot of people use Skype. And then how many of you sent like care packages? All right. Now, that was a lovely gesture and it was a way to keep you connected while they were gone. So have you thought about how you could probably keep that up now that they're coming back? A thank you, just a small note. Even if you could just take a small note card and stick it in their boot before they get ready to go to work. So when they're putting on their boot, they find this little note card. It's not a care package, but it's a way that you can take the way that what you were doing during the deployment to bring it back while he's, when he's come back during the reintegration. And it's a good way to stay connected that way. Now, you all have handouts on your table. And this is something that you can do at home because we don't have time here to do it. But this is remapping. You're going to remap about how your uh, relationship is. And you're going to get to, this is getting to know your spouse again. One of the things that you want to sit down and write is things how you have changed and how you think your spouse has changed. You also want to think about what attracted you to your spouse and what you felt uh, your, attracted your spouse to you. Write those things down and share those with your spouse now before they get back. So that way you can start building that connection. And you can also look at how you've changed and if there's certain things that you need to adjust to because of those changes. So that's what I was talking about on the remap. And that's what you have in your workbook. To create a loving friendship, we have to think about what our spouse is thinking about. So when we're talking about um, creating a loving friendship, you may think, be thinking about the kids. He's thinking about the kids. You're looking at changes. He may be into weightlifting now. And he's thinking that you don't like the we anymore. Now these may seem like very insignificant type things, but if you look at it, if you, for instance, if we flip that, and you weren't that much into physical fitness at all while they were, when he was here, and now that you're into, now you're into physical fitness, that might set up, you know, he might not be comfortable with that. It's like, well, why are you changing now? It might set up, you know, those why questions. So you want to make sure that you, you're letting your spouse know, this is what I do now. I go to the gym, and it's because I want to feel good about myself or whatever the situation may be. But the most important part to take away from this is that if you have changed, make sure that you're sharing those little things, because it may be something very little, but you want to make sure that you share that with your spouse, how you changed. And the same goes for him. They should be sharing with you how they changed. So you look at now, he's into mountain biking, or you have two new good friends. It's important to make sure that you let your spouse know about your new friendships, because you don't want that to become a topic of, you know, where it can open up argument, or, or I'm losing my words, <laughs> where it can open up argument or where you can have a disagreement because of it.
All right, so you want to make sure that you're letting your spouse know that you have these new friends, where you met these people at. And the same goes for him, because if he has a new battle buddy that you were not aware of, and all of a sudden he's talking about this battle buddy all the time, you want to know about that. So you want to make sure that he's um, letting you know who his new friends are as well. And then you have, you know, you may have switched to green tea. Still likes coffee, but uh, switched to skim milk. Switch to boxer shorts. You might think that's a very insignificant thing, but in one class we had, the spouse was very upset because she wanted to know why. Why did you switch to boxer shorts? You were wearing boxer briefs. To me, that's not a big deal what kind of underwear you want to wear. But for her, it was an issue. And then, you know, it might be important to know because if you bought him all new underwear and you went out and bought him what he was wearing before and he comes back and says, well, I don't wear those anymore, that might be an issue. The same with your eating habits. You know, you may be having sleep problems. And here, where's it at? I'm looking for my broccoli. Can't look at broccoli anymore, okay? Maybe they got inundated with broccoli while they were over there and he just can't stand the broccoli and it brings back these bad memories. That's something that they need to share with you prior to getting back so you don't go out and buy all this broccoli. A better example of that is Back when 4-1 came back, one of the um, soldiers had decided to become a vegetarian while they were over there. Now, he didn't share this with his spouse that he was going to be a vegetarian. So when he comes home, the spouse has created this big steak dinner, and she's very upset because he's not eating this steak dinner. But now he's like, well, I'm a vegetarian. That's something that you need to make sure that you're sharing with your spouse. If you've changed your eating habits, you need to make sure you share that. If they've changed their eating habits, you need to make sure, he needs to make sure that he's shared that with you. Or you need to ask the question, you know, do you still like this? Do you still like steak? Or would you rather have tofu? You know, that's, that's a question that you might need to ask. And then we still go on to still doesn't like peas prefers to watch sports at home, not go to the movies, prefers DVDs instead of going to the movies, sex and spooning, sex and spooning, however you want to look at it, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> some of you might say, oh, yay. Some of you might be like, oh, no. So, <laughs> but you know, you want to make sure that you're sharing with your spouse how you feel about these things, all right? And that's what your little worksheets, which you can do um, when you get home. We also want to talk about how you confront, confront problems successfully. Because what we have in the full resilience training, we have a sound marital house. And the foundation of that sound marital house is fondness and admiration. And then confronting problems, that's part of reconnecting. And that's going to be your main floor there. You can use what's called repair attempts and gentle starts when you're having a disagreement with your spouse. Okay. So this is when something comes up, you want to make sure that you diffuse the situation in an effective manner. Sometimes, you know, we can hit speed bumps and we're going to have disagreements because regardless of how lovey-dovey we are, we're all human and we're not always going to agree on everything. So we are going to have disagreements. Now, these are attempts, a repair attempt is when you're trying to diffuse the situation. And as you can read up here, there are ways that you can dis diffuse the situation. You can agree to disagree, or if you have a way where you and your spouse like to joke a lot, where maybe they can joke, start joking with you, or they stick their tongue out at you while you're in the heat of the argument, they just kind of stick their tongue out at you, and that kind of diffuses it. It lets you let your guard down. Or you might be in a situation where you guys can make sarcastic statements to each other, and your spouse, you know, you're in the heat of argument, and your spouse says, drop and give me 20. That might be something, if that's the kind of relationship you have, that it would diffuse it. Now, for me, if somebody said, drop and give me 20, I'm like, yeah, right. That's just going to make me matter, OK? <laughs> but if, if it makes you laugh, that could be a way of diffusing things. Because for me, if you can make me laugh, if you can do something, even if I'm arguing, if you can even get just the slightest little smile out of me, then that's diffusing the situation. Okay, and then I'm going to be more open to what you're saying. And then you want to make sure that you accept what your partner is saying. You want to accept their influence. You don't want to just totally discount and just say, no, you're wrong, and I don't want to hear it. It's my way or the highway. Okay, you don't want to be like that. 
and then direct, uh, you want to directly confront the problems. You don't want to put it on the back burner. You want to go ahead and, go and get that problem out. Go ahead and start talking about it. Don't wait six months from now to talk about something that happened, you know, if they bring it up now. You want to make sure you confront the problem now, all right? What do you think they're saying? If you look at these couples, how do you think their communication skills are? If you look at the couple on your right or your left. They don't have anything good to say to each other. They don't have anything good to say to each other. And you can look at that by their body language, right? And then if you look on the couple on the left, on your right, I'm getting confused with my left and right. I have to do like this. <laughs> if you look at them, they're communicating, they're happy, they're looking at each other. Their body language is saying that they're open. So what you want to keep in mind is that it's in, as important that your body language is in, is in as tuned with what you're saying as what you're saying. If I come in and I say I'm happy, but I'm like this, okay, yeah, I'm happy. Is that telling you I'm happy? Or if your spouse asks you, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm fine. Is that telling your spouse that you're fine or is it telling them that, they have, that you're having another issue? It's probably telling them that you have another issue but just because of your body language. Because the majority of what somebody gets from you, they read from your body language. It's not so much about the words, but it's about how your facial expressions are and what you're doing with your body. Okay? So you don't want to fake and say, I'm fine, while you're rolling your eyes. Because they're going to read into that rolling your eyes and know that you're really not fine. All right? So we have what's called gentle starts when you're confronting the problem. When we're doing these gentle starts, we want to make sure that we're using I statements instead of you statements. Do you know why we want to do that? Defensive and it's accusatory. Because if I come up to you and say, you never do anything right, is that going to put you on the defense? Maybe, a little bit. <laughs> Versus, you know, if I come at you and say it with an I statement and put myself first, okay? So we want to make sure that we're using I statements instead of you statements. And as I was saying before, you want to make sure you don't store up your complaints. You don't want to hold on to all those things that you thought were going wrong. And then once you, have one, um, once you start getting into this discussion, then you start bringing up things that happened a month ago, six months ago, things that happened before you even left for deployment. And now you want to bring it up now that they're back. Make sure you keep, um, when you're having a problem, keep it to that specific problem. Don't reach back and start grabbing at things that have long passed. So you want to make sure that you keep a complaint to that specific complaint. If there are things that happened prior, then set aside a time and say, okay, I want to talk about this. Make it specific and then say, this is what we're talking about. But if you're talking about a certain thing at that moment, don't reach back and start bringing up things from the past. And you can just, like I said, set aside a time and say, you know, hey, I'd like to speak with you about this situation. So you're bringing up a specific situation, even though it may have happened before, but because you didn't confront it or because it didn't get resolved, you're bringing it up and you can talk about it. But don't bring it up if you're talking about it or talking about something else. And then you want to make sure that comes to timing your communication. Because you don't want to wait until you have a house full of people or that you're sitting there and you're having a quiet moment and then you decide that you want to talk about something that happened before. You want to make sure that, you, that your timing is good, okay? That you're both open to receive what's going to be going on, all right? Then we have what's called a harsh start. And that's when you begin with those accusatory uh, tone or a harsh tone. And that's those you statements. You don't want to start like that. And then we're going to, I'm going to briefly talk to you about what's called the four horsemen when we're communicating. The four horsemen are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And we're going to go over each one of those. Criticism versus kindness. All right, so a go, a, criticism is actually a global complaint that's attacking that person's personality traits. You're attacking that person. You're not, attack, you're not talking about anything specific. You're talking about that person's character. It's like a character assassination type situation. This is the event. The soldier doesn't um, take out the trash as he had promised. When you're criticizing somebody, you come back and you're like, you're a terrible husband. You don't care about the family. That's kind of harsh because you didn't take out the trash, right? I'm a, that's character assassination. 
Because you didn't take out the trash, that makes you a terrible person. You don't care about this family at all. So instead of criticizing, we can do a, a kind request and say something like, I know you have a lot going on and I would appreciate if you took out the trash. Okay, just something very simple. Instead of saying you don't care about the family because you don't take out the trash or you never take out the trash, go ahead and just say, you know, you have a lot going on, but I'd appreciate if you took the trash out. So that's our criticism. We have contempt. Contempt is a mocking attitude and sarcasm, okay, where you're being very sarcastic. Here, the spouse makes a mistake in the checkbook, and they come, the soldier comes back and say, hey, genius, you screwed up the checkbook. Okay, you're dumb as a rock. Is that, no, that's not on this one, okay. But anyway, <laughs> exactly. Now, how do you think you're going to respond to if somebody's saying something to you like that? Uh, exactly. But the way this is coming off is like you make this mistake all the time. And we don't want to be cut there, caught there. So what we could do, instead of that soldier saying that, he can come back and say, you know, you did a good job of taking care of the checkbook while we were gone, while I was gone. But I noticed that there are a couple little mistakes. Maybe we can sit down and talk about it. That comes off a lot more easier than you just come telling me I screwed up the checkbook again. And why can't I get it right? Then we have defensiveness versus acknowledgement. Now, when you're being defensive, you're warding off an attack because you think somebody's coming after you. The event is you're angry all the time since you got back and you're picking fights with everything, with everyone.